Hi there, this is Crazy John Kuritz, and I'm here again with Gennady Stolior, and he is the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. But wanted to touch base, recently there's been a lot of changes going on with the politics, and we've been discussing a couple times before on, uh, I'd say maybe it's like your matrix of who would win based on this, like you have a, a you know, if, if this person ran against that person, it would probably be this person, if this ran against that person. So... Right now, I think, you know, with Biden stepping down, which has looked real good for him, people love the fact that he gave up the pride. And I wasn't sure he would do it myself personally, because I know he was stubborn and he wanted to run again. Uh, but I've noticed a change from when I've seen him live to how he's been recently, too. But he gave that up. And now that Ms. Harris is running, I see that uh, the Democrats have very much been invigorated and there's more backing and there's people and there's a lot of excitement. And uh, I think that has thrown Trump and his people off balance. And I, I think it's a good thing, actually. But I have you here tonight so you can tell the people what you think's going on and how you think it'll go. What, what, how do you think things are going? Yes. Well, thank you, John. And this has been quite an unexpected series of developments. A lot of wild cards have been thrown into the presidential race. So first of all, there was the debate performance of Joe Biden, which was very unfortunate. We learned there that we finally beat Medicare and various other new discoveries from Joe Biden's imagination that we were not aware of previously. And this led to a sea change in the attitudes within the Democratic Party among major donors and supporters of Joe Biden, who essentially realized what critics of Joe Biden have been saying now for about two years, which is that Joe Biden had been suffering from cognitive decline, and it was apparent. So they essentially needed to pivot very rapidly. And the next day, we saw editorials in the New York Times and on CNN essentially urging Biden to step down. And it took about three and a half weeks for him to be persuaded to step down. He ultimately did. In the meantime, of course, the very frightening assassination attempt on Donald Trump happened on July 13th. And this was quite alarming because whatever one thinks of Donald Trump, a successful assassination attempt would have created a major precedent for the use of violence against one's opponents. And this would have been a major step down in terms of the norms of American politics, which are already quite troubling in terms of all of the ad hominems that get thrown around, all of the attempted character assassinations, uses of the legal system against one's opponents. But this would have been a new low. And it is extremely fortunate that that attempt failed, even though security was fraught with gaps at that event. But we were a few inches away from civil war, as I've sometimes characterized it. And Donald Trump's reaction to that event, as well as I think the natural sympathies that many people have for a person in that situation who narrowly escapes death, did boost him, I think, in terms of the polls, in terms of support among voters who had been wavering. But then Joe Biden's decision to not pursue the nomination and his endorsement of Kamala Harris again changed the landscape. So I think Trump's survival of the assassination attempt did give him a boost, but the choice of Kamala Harris gave the Democrats a boost as well. So which of these two is going to predominate? That's a very interesting question. And prior to all of these events, my framework for evaluating the likely outcome of this election was if not Trump runs against Biden, then not Trump would win. If not Biden runs against Trump, then not Biden would win. And if Biden runs against Trump, then Trump would beat Biden. So I think the Democrats were on the way 
to defeat if Biden had remained the nominee. But according to my framework, I think not Biden, in this case Kamala, is likely to beat Trump. And the reason for this is that the American electorate lived through the presidencies of both Trump and Biden. And both were bad in their own ways, in my view. And I think ordinary Americans experienced the problems with both of these presidencies. There were violations of civil liberties involved with both of those administrations, but I think Trump's worst year was definitely 2020. And the response to the COVID pandemic was suboptimal to say the least. And that was a year of a lot of suffering that people still remember. Now with Biden, there were a lot of economic problems during his presidency, skyrocketing costs of living, periodic bouts of scarcity of goods and services, the very fact that the pandemic was not solved and people's lives continue to be much more difficult than they were in 2019 before the pandemic started. Whether or not that is Biden's fault or that Biden simply was powerless to do anything about it, in the minds of the American electorate, that has kind of tainted Biden. And Kamala Harris, while she was part of his administration, she kind of stayed on the sidelines. So to many people, she's still an unknown quantity. And she can present a rhetorical case for her being the preferable choice, which I think a lot of people will at least consider. Now, of course, as chairman of the Transhumanist Party, I don't support either of these two sides, but that's my evaluation of the current state of the race. I will also say that the Libertarian Party narrowly escaped essentially descending into irrelevance because at the Libertarian National Convention, for whatever reason, the leadership of the party decided to sabotage the party's own candidates who were running for the nomination and instead invited Donald Trump and RFK Jr. to each give speeches, not to debate with the libertarian candidates, but the libertarian party leadership just gave them the floor. And this was before the libertarian party candidates could speak or get the endorsement of the delegates. So what happened was ultimately after numerous rounds of balloting, I believe there were seven rounds, Chase Oliver did win the Libertarian nomination, but he won a little over 60% of the vote and a little under 40% of the delegates there voted for none of the above. If none of the above had won, essentially the Libertarian Party would not have endorsed any candidate during this election cycle, which would have been seen essentially as a capitulation to Donald Trump, because the Donald Trump supporters among the Libertarian Party leadership and delegates essentially wanted this outcome because they wanted the Libertarian Party to become a feeder organization into Donald Trump's Republican Party, exactly the kind of scenario that I want to avoid with the transhumanist party by any means that I can deploy. And it would have been such a tragedy because there's such a vast gulf of difference between libertarianism, any school of libertarianism and Donald Trump's agenda. Then we have the Green Party. The Green Party is nominating Jill Stein again, and she has run multiple times for office now. I think she is an articulate spokesperson for the Green Party's ideas, and she can definitely hold her own in a debate. She participated in the free and equal debate in Las Vegas on July 12th. But the Green Party has also had a rift. So Cornell West was to be its nominee, but he and Jill Stein had a falling out, and now he won't appear on the same debate stage with Jill Stein for whatever reason. And it seems to me that the Green Party has a certain history of factionalism of its own that it needs to overcome.
And then finally, there are the two so-called independent candidates, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Cornell West. And the biggest issue I see with them, apart from any disagreements I may have with them on policy, is that they say that they want to challenge the political establishment, but they themselves refuse to debate with any other third party candidates. They only want to debate with Trump and previously Biden. Now, probably they'll say they want to debate with Kamala Harris. But that means they're implicitly legitimizing the duopoly, the two party system, by only considering those candidates to be worthy of debating with. Whereas, of course, we in the Transhumanist Party favor much more open, inclusive debates where candidates of as many parties as want to participate can express their views and engage one another on the policy issues. So that's my assessment of this election cycle. But we still have a little less than 100 days to go and much can change in between now and November. I think a lot of things that are up in the air are the vice presidents also, and I'm curious how that will affect it. I've heard some talking that they're not necessarily happy with J.D. for Trump and that they've been some talk that they might push him out and choose somebody else. And uh, Harris hasn't chosen anybody yet. I know that there is a big organization putting big ads in the papers and down in D.C. and everything for them not to choose Pennsylvania Shapiro. And it's like, I'm not sure what's up with that. I was at the uh, rally this, well, he gave like a little rally speech on Saturday in Carlisle. And it was, it was good. I've seen him speak before with Biden and stuff. But this organization put out a full page ad in a Washington, D.C. newspaper against him. But there's supposedly a, a paper for Pennsylvania government. That was interesting to me. And, uh, you know, I've been a supporter of uh, Mark Kelly for a long time. You know, I like space. And I also like the fact that with him being a uh, twin, you could do the research on his genetics, haven't been in space so long compared to his brother. And uh, that's interesting stuff. And I, I, I like him. But it's interesting uh, how that's going to affect things, too. And I think that will affect also other people that vote along with it with the group well what are your thoughts on the vice president candidates for harris and who trump had picked what do you think about that well it's interesting i think it's very difficult to remove a vice presidential candidate from a ticket once that person has already been selected in the absence of serious misconduct that would simply look bad from a public relations standpoint even if the candidate is not ideal. I think the Trump campaign's inclination is going to be to tolerate him now that he has been selected. Now, J.D. Vance has said some strange, <laughs> strange things while on the campaign circuit, like the idea that people with children should have more voting power than people without children. And he suggested essentially giving every person of any age the right to vote, but the votes of the children would be under control of their parents. And my thinking is I'm not opposed to expanding the voting age. I do think there are some younger people who know more about politics and who know more about the American system of government than a lot of adults. And so I would be in support of broadening the franchise perhaps subject to the person under a certain age passing a civics test, a test that would evaluate knowledge of the U.S. Constitution, of U.S. history, of how the government works and how the office that they are voting for works. What are the powers of that office? I wouldn't be opposed to that. But in that case, the young person's vote should be their own. The parent should not be entitled in that case to cast the vote of their offspring. Now, that's just one example. And I think there will be others that people can take issue with J.D. Vance's stances on. But I think once Trump made his selection, he is going to persist in that. Keep in mind, he kept Mike Pence as his vice president for four years, despite very clear 
ideological differences. Perhaps the purpose of having J.D. Vance there is to secure the support of a certain segment of the technology and venture capital sectors since J.D. Vance worked for Peter Thiel. Now, on a related note, I'm a bit disappointed and somewhat troubled by how many tech entrepreneurs whose ideas I found admirable in various respects, for instance, Peter Thiel, Mark Andreessen, and even Elon Musk. Now, I've had my differences with Elon Musk, but I do think a lot of his endeavors in actually developing and scaling technologies have been quite admirable. They all endorse Trump. And perhaps J.D. Vance is part of their connection to Trump. Trump wants their support because they are obviously wealthy and influential people. They can donate to his campaign and they can also influence a segment of the social media landscape which conventional politicians would find difficult to reach. So I am going to have some issues with how that segment of the tech world perceives politics. Why don't they support the transhumanist party? We are closer to actually trying to achieve ideals that they claim they want to achieve. Donald Trump may pay them lip service, but I don't think he's actually going to realize the vision of someone like Mark Andreessen or Peter Thiel or even Elon Musk. But in terms of the Democrats, the Democratic Party has had this issue for a long time that they have a kind of pre-configured succession system. And whoever the vice presidential nominee is, is essentially presumed to be next in line for the presidency. So with a few exceptions, like Hillary Clinton was able to get ahead of Joe Biden in line, but it was pretty clear that Joe Biden was expected to run for president at some point after being Obama's vice president. And this happened before as well. Al Gore ran for president after being Clinton's vice president. Walter Mondale ran for president after being Jimmy Carter's vice president. So there's a pattern within the Democratic Party where they're trying to essentially preordain a lineup of people. And every election season, it's somebody's turn. So the reason why the Democratic Party apparatus essentially worked to shoehorn Hillary Clinton in in 2016 and then Joe Biden in in 2020 is because according to that framework, it was their turn during those years. And it was almost Joe Biden's turn again, since he was the incumbent, were it not obvious that he was no longer suited for the job. So now it's Kamala's turn because she is his vice president. And whomever Kamala selects is going to be understood to be the Democratic candidate in either 2028 or 2032, depending on how many terms Kamala serves. And of course, whether if she wins, she lasts more than one term. But I think that's why there's a lot of discussion and a lot of, let's say, heated rhetoric and the kinds of advertisements that you mentioned, because I think Democratic Party insiders are aware that whoever gets selected this time is going to be the presidential nominee at some point. That's an interesting point. Yeah, you had me think about a couple of things. I liked your idea about the voting. It made me think of like 16 year olds getting their uh, junior uh, voting permit, you know, like you get your junior license, you know which would have some maybe interesting restrictions. I don't know, maybe there's only certain elections you can vote for and some you can't. I don't know. That would be kind of interesting. But that is an interesting idea. I mean, it reminds me of the days when people could go off to war at 18 but couldn't drink. And then they're like, well, that's not fair. But they, in some places, lowered the drinking age, but then they raised it back up. People can do things at a certain age and they can't do other things. So that, that is an interesting point. Some of the things that JD said were kind of interesting and... I was thinking about the cat lady stuff that people have been commenting on and on itself. That's also sexist. I mean, 
there are those of us that are men that like cats, you know? <laughs> so what's with that, you know? But yeah, it is interesting how they're going to play it. I like your idea, though. You were very right about the Democrats. Democrats have very much always had that view of moving that person into the next position. It's almost like he was being groomed in his position as vice president to become the president, which might be a reason why, like you said, they don't want to do that. But who do you think might be, this is putting you back on the spot here. I mean, I guess like Mark Kelly's a big pick. Shapiro's a big pick. Now I did hear that this was interesting to me today. I read this today. One of the gentlemen from North Carolina that was on Harris's list for vice president, he actually withdrew and I thought, oh, that's shocking. He doesn't want to be on Harris as a vice president. But actually, his reasoning was his deputy, I think it's governor or whatever, is a Republican. And he actually said that he was afraid that while he was not, if he'd be in all, out campaigning and stuff, when he'd leave the state, he'd be afraid that his deputy would take over for him as a Republican, would take over the state in running it because of uh, using about his absence and being a thing to uh, basically take over the, his position. And I thought, well, that's it's an interesting world where you also have to worry about that, which I thought was interesting too, that that was his fear. And it kind of led to what the conditions of some of the shenanigans, let's say shenanigans, that could go on right now between the Republicans and the Democrats. So that was interesting to me that that's what he was afraid of. I thought it was going to be that he didn't feel like he wanted to support Harris, but that wasn't the issue. He was afraid of what would happen in his own state. And I think that's some of the issues I've heard about Mark Kelly there in Arizona that I guess in the position he's in right now, he's doing some things and he has some projects and that if he moved out into vice president, that might not be something he wants to necessarily do because of things he is working on and progressing with. But the main thing that they picked in that article about Shapiro was that they said that he was basically giving lip service. He was saying he was going to do things and he wasn't doing anything. But I've noticed a lot of times people think that people can just get into power, or get elected, and they think they're going to like wave their magic wand and they can make all these changes right away. And I think that's an impractical way for people to think and expectations are high. So I'm not sure really if that's really an issue or just being made into an issue. But what do you think? So who do you think would be a good vice president for the Democrats? So obviously, I don't have insider knowledge as to whom Kamala would pick. And she essentially has said that she will make that decision in less than a week. So any prediction I make would be dated. But if I were to make a choice just from a tactical perspective, it would be Pete Buttigieg, because, and this is quite a pragmatic case for selecting him, he is not occupying a position that the Democrats will need a loyal person to hold on to after the election, because he's Secretary of Transportation for the Biden administration right now. He's not a governor of a state. He's not a senator in a district that might be contested. So if Biden stops being president, which he will, Pete will stop being secretary of transportation. He could move to another role, such as vice president, and then Kamala could easily appoint somebody else as secretary of transportation. So if she were just making the decision based on not wanting to remove an ally from a post that she wants her allies to occupy, then Pete would be the safest choice from that standpoint. Now, I don't know if that is how she would think, but in a position where I just wanted to select somebody who wouldn't jeopardize any other interest or any other role, I would select somebody who was going to be moving out of their current role anyway. I like that. That is a good idea. And actually, I'm sure you're aware, Pete did a great job over the last week on Fox speaking. He was phenomenal the way he kept everything on track and the woman kept trying to detour him. 
he was a great, phenomenal speaker. I mean, he did great. And he was on, uh, him and John Stewart were talking about that too. And he is a good speaker and he is doing a great job right now, I think, in how he's promoting the Democrats. I think he is doing a good job. And that might even, that along with like what you said, might bend it in his favor. And like, basically what you said, you supported what I said about Mark Kelly and the gentleman from North Carolina. The positions they're in right now are kind of, they're doing things right now and and if they left it, would that be good? And that might be the same thing with Shapiro, too. I don't know. Moving him out, I don't know what that would do. You know, I'm not really sure how that would go. Might be the other thing, like you said, too, might weaken the Democrats in Pennsylvania, which is kind of seen as a, well, one of those swing kind of states where they want to try and get it and hold it because of the number of people in Pennsylvania. So, uh that is a good point. That is interesting. And uh, did you see uh, Pete speak on Fox or did you get to see any of those clips? I did not get to see him directly since I had been traveling recently That's right. I went uh, yes. to the Global Cryonics Summit. So a lot of these events happened while I was in travel mode. And I was just informed, for instance, of Biden's decision not to pursue the nomination. And I was catching up, essentially reading news articles. But events are moving at a rapid pace. It seems like not just in the United States, but in other places throughout the world, there's a sea change politically and culturally that will transform how politics is undertaken and furthermore perhaps transform the directions of various societies and our entire civilization we have the first ever libertarian president javier Millet, in argentina who is by the way a friend of our technology advisor jose cordero and a former student of Jose's. And Jose says that Javier Malay is an immortalist. And Malay has credited Jose's book, The Death of Death, as one of his influences. So there's some hope there. In Britain, of course, there was an election where the Tory party, the Conservative Party, which had been in power since 2010, suffered a massive electoral defeat. And I think there were numerous reasons for that, a history of incompetence and borderline corruption, as well as, frankly, belligerence with the way the Boris Johnson government especially approached the conflict in Ukraine and kind of adding fuel to the fire. And the British electorate finally rejected the Tories when they had the opportunity to actually exercise the popular vote. Now, it's interesting, too, in France, there was a massive leftward shift in terms of the composition of the National Assembly. And that was unexpected, because it was thought that Marine Le Pen's far right party would have won. But the voters kind of reacted against that specter. And now it's going to be an interesting situation but they also rejected Macron's ruling party, which is now quite far in the minority. I think what is happening is that voters are not uniformly shifting to the left or to the right. I don't think they necessarily think in those terms for the most part. I think they're voting against the status quo, whatever that is, whoever the ruling party is. Again, because economic conditions have been bad, and I'm not necessarily talking about statistical indicators or abstractions, I'm talking about people's lived experience. Generally, if you talk to the majority of people in any Western country, whether they're middle class, upper middle class, or whether they're poorer, they're going to say, life has not been good these past few years. And it might not be that they're running out of money, but everybody has experienced some sort of hardship. And I believe fundamentally, COVID is at the root of the majority of these troubles that people are experiencing and the secondary and tertiary effects of COVID. But the frustration that a lot of people have with the 
ruling elites, the establishments of the countries in which they reside, is that those establishments have shown themselves to completely lack the ability to address this kind of crisis and to do anything to sustainably help large numbers of people. The best attempt, I think, was Operation Warp Speed in the United States, which did lead to some rapid development of vaccines. And for a little while, that helped. Unfortunately, the virus kept mutating faster than vaccines could be authorized, not necessarily faster than they could be developed in theory and made available in a freer system. But given the current constraints, especially regulatory constraints, the vaccine rollout was too slow. And because the vaccines failed to conclusively knock down this virus, there emerged an anti-vaccine constituency as well. And that led to further polarization, politicization of this issue. I think any government that undertook a successful effort to develop a universal vaccine against COVID would have secured its place and power for a long time to come. But no government dares to do that now. But after a while, the voters essentially rejected every single administration that was in power during the height of the pandemic. That included Trump, of course, because Trump lost the 2020 election, I think because of COVID. He wouldn't have lost it were it not for COVID. He could have claimed a fairly decent economic track record otherwise. But Biden, too, is now seen as a pandemic-era incumbent. Hence, I think he would have lost if he had run against Trump, because Trump at least has tried to kind of reinvent himself. And he says so many things that he wants people to forget what he said two days ago, not to mention four years ago. But likewise, the conservatives were in power in Britain during COVID. Macron was in power in France during COVID. And I think in Russia, if there were actually free elections, Putin would be out of power as well. He doesn't want that, of course. And I think he started the war in Ukraine in part to bolster his popularity because it was so adversely affected by COVID. And of course, he was relying on the war being quick and easy, like a painless boost to his domestic ratings, as well as a geopolitical achievement. He completely underestimated the Ukrainian military's ability and willingness to resist. He completely underestimated the global reaction to this war. And as a result, he has immersed himself in a quagmire. But because Russia is not a free country politically, he can stay in power using various tactics of manipulation and suppression of dissent. But I think we will continue to see anti-establishment attitudes among voters as long as this crisis persists, as long as there's no viable, sustainable solution to the pandemic and its effects. All good points. And uh, before we started this, I was talking also to you about how I've heard a lot of chatter where people are bringing up things about transhumanism. Of course, they're misguided in their beliefs, but I think some of that's because, like I said to you, people are afraid of change. I've been reading the new book by Keanu Reeves, and uh, he talks a lot about his concern about death being older himself. In his book, he, it's a hero that actually is immortal. And it's an interesting concept. And uh, my thought I'm having here is he might be a great person for us in, in the, the transhumanist party. And speaking of that, now the transhumanist party has their own candidates. We have Tom Ross and we have his running mate. And I think they're great people this time and great representatives. Not that the last time they weren't great candidates either. I liked last times also. How is that going and how is things going with the Tom Ross campaign? Yes. So the Tom Ross, Daniel Tweed 2024 campaign continues. And we are still trying to get ballot access in Louisiana and Tennessee. If any of your viewers are from those two states, please get in contact with us because we still need electors from some of the congressional districts in both Louisiana and Tennessee. We have about half of the necessary electors in Tennessee right now, but we need 
the other half essentially. And we're in the process of gathering signatures for the petition in Tennessee. We need at least 275 signatures and we need eight electors in Louisiana. So other than that, of course, Darth Vader has endorsed Tom Ross for president. Thank you for that, John. I don't think any other political party can claim that distinction. And Tom has also been quite active with his messaging for his campaign. He has published articles regularly on his Medium profile. And also, I would encourage everyone to visit his website at tomross.com slash 2024.html. He had a recent interview with Decrypt, which is a cryptocurrency blockchain technology oriented publication that is going to come out soon as well. So I would encourage everyone to be on the lookout for that. As Tom emphasizes, the primary purpose of his campaign is essentially to be a marketing campaign for transhumanism and to get people to think about politics differently and also to think about the technological transformations that are affecting our society differently. And this is, of course, part of the sea change that I mentioned in my previous comments, because, for instance, generative AI has taken hold and it has enabled many new abilities and many new ways of doing work as well. So how are we going to respond to that? Are we going to respond through fear or are we going to respond by understanding the opportunity that this technology presents? We also need a response to algorithmic manipulation, whether that be propaganda that people encounter or just the fact that when we engage on social media, we are often steered in directions other than those in which we would prefer to go. And Tom has a lot of ideas, a lot of guidance that people could consider and adopt in their own lives, irrespective of who wins this election. And I think it's very helpful in the political arena to have candidates like Tom who speak to the implications of technology and desirable ways of reacting, responding to technology, harnessing technology that are just completely omitted by mainstream politicians. So the Biden administration issued this immensely lengthy executive order on AI and Somehow Kamala Harris got appointed as the AI czar of the Biden administration. But how much do these politicians actually understand this technology? Or are they just trying to impose existing frameworks for various task forces, committees, ways of creating rules that really belong to a previous era, that are really the products of an analog era, and they don't anticipate the speed with which these technologies develop, and they neither anticipate nor understand the uses to which this technology can be put. And that is why we need somebody like Tom Ross running for office who will talk about these implications. We are starting to get into the age of deep fakes in political campaigns. There were videos circulating recently of politicians' voices essentially being fabricated. And I think a discerning individual can still tell a deep fake apart from a genuine recording. There are signs. There are ways in which these voices don't quite sound authentically human. They're too smooth, they're too polished, they're too even. However, I would not put it past large segments of voters to fail to notice those distinctions, or maybe even selectively not notice them when not noticing them is convenient for reinforcing their own views. Like if they think a particular politician is bad or inclined to say bad things, and they encounter a deep fake 
video of that politician saying those bad things, they may be inclined to believe that. Whereas a politician on their side, of course, would never say those kinds of terrible things. So any video that shows them saying them is a deep fake. But we have this fundamental problem in the so-called post-truth political environment. And that problem is exacerbated by these technological advancements, but only through understanding those technologies and knowing how to harness them, can we counter these nefarious uses and leverage these technologies for purposes that are conducive to truth and understanding and human flourishing. I think we've talked before, too, about the fact that, you know, it's good to show people that there are other candidates. I mean, Tom's mentioning a lot of issues that they don't mention. And uh, again, sometimes I think candidates don't mention things that they are concerned that the populace might misunderstand also. So they don't want to get mucked down in that. But I think showing that there's other candidates is important and to show that there's other thinking in other ways other than the big two is very important. And you mentioned Elon Musk before. And a lot of the people, I feel a lot of them went and backed Trump because they thought it was going to be a slam dunk for Trump, especially when he was going to be him against Biden. And I think a lot of people sided with Trump thinking that it will be good for them in the long run once he gets back into office. I hate to say that, but it seemed to me like a lot of people, even Elon did that. Because I remember before he pulled out of being on one of Trump's committees the first time because he said that didn't quite sit well with him doing that. But now here he is. And I think a lot of people sided with him because in the long run, they felt he was going to win and that it would be good for them in the long run. I hate to say that, but I think that's kind of true. I don't know how you feel about that. But I think they side with him for personal gain in the long run. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that so many people have this tendency to back the winning side as if it's somehow a boost to them that they chose the side that happened to win. And it's not even a reflection of what they want or what they value, but for whatever reason, being the winner to them or being on the side of the winner is more important than being on the side that actually does something that they want to achieve. So my view is, and it has always been, I am not as concerned with who is going to win the election. I am concerned with me personally not supporting outcomes or candidates or positions that I would later regret. So if I were to support a candidate who won and then who committed some errors or transgressions, whether unintentional or deliberate, I would be upset. I would regret that support, and I never want to be in that kind of position. I would rather vote according to my principles and back a candidate who has very little chance of winning. But I would know that in the event that that candidate won, that candidate would make a difference for the better. And even in supporting that person, I would be making a difference for the better by highlighting that person's ideas, by highlighting priorities that are overlooked by the other candidates. And in doing that, in giving voice to these topics and these aspirations, it's quite possible that other politicians or just people from the culture and the society more generally will pick up on these ideas and will try to do something in directions that I would consider beneficial. So I have always urged people, whatever their resources are, whatever their ability to affect the outcome of the election, which for an individual is not that great, to vote their consciences. Because that is the best way to be able to live with oneself, essentially, no matter what happens, I can be confident that I didn't cause it. And furthermore, I can be confident that I tried to make a positive difference. But with these tech entrepreneurs who are supporting Trump, I think you're correct. Part of that was 
perhaps in anticipation that he might win and he might do them some special favors, especially because Trump is not a very ideological person himself, actually. He's more opportunistic. And he thinks in terms of, well, who is on his side? So if he thinks this person was on his side during the election campaign, he might reward that person. He might at least perhaps refrain from persecuting that person as much. But seriously, if a prominent public figure were to go on social media right now and write something in glowing praise of Trump, Trump would not care who they are and what they did before or where they stand on any of the other issues. Trump would just say, okay, this is a great person because this person supports Donald Trump. That is quite likely one of the reasons why these entrepreneurs are trying to appeal to him. I just expected a bit more of a principled set of stances from them. And perhaps a more charitable interpretation is they're locked into the two-party trap as well. They only think it's realistic for either a Republican or a Democrat to win. And they have some serious issues with aspects of the Democratic Party agenda. So as an example, we can take Elon. And for Elon, this may be personal because he has a transgender offspring who essentially rejected Elon. And he may be upset at transgender advocacy. He may consider transgender advocacy to be to blame. And he sees the Democrats as being responsible for it, or at least promoting it heavily. So he might support Trump for entirely personal reasons. And also, it probably doesn't help that the Democratic establishment attacked him quite viciously when he acquired control of Twitter, now X, and he was seen as kind of the enemy of that establishment. So he reacted against that by supporting what he might consider the other side. It's not actually the other side, by the way, because the Republicans want internet censorship as well. The Republicans support a ban on TikTok. The Republicans support various restrictions on social media, even removal of Section 230 protections, which are essentially protections against liability of the social media platform for content that their users post. So if a social media platform were fully liable for what any individual user posted, you can bet there would be much heavier censorship on those platforms than exists today. And both the Democrats and the Republicans are actually white strongly on the side of greater social media censorship. And that's something that Elon, I think, does not recognize. But nonetheless, I can see in some of their cases that these tech entrepreneurs may be thinking Trump is not ideal, but the Democrats are much worse. And it's this pernicious trap of the two-party system where people don't so much vote in support of one option, but they vote against the other option. And each election season, it seems the options keep getting worse on both sides. You know, a lot of interesting points yeah, about Elon and stuff, too. I didn't think about some of that. I do know he's been having issues about his son. And yeah, that could change his views, too. Uh, I, I still think a lot of it, though, goes back to people thinking it was going to be a slam dunk for Trump. And I do think, like you say, you're going to vote for who you feel is better. Like the old saying goes, you want to be able to sleep at night. And some of these people, I don't know how they're sleeping at night. I hope they do get something for it because some of them have really done flip-flops. And uh, it, it's amazing to me. I was thinking, though, you know, it would be nice this time to have uh, a woman president. A woman president who's not uh, necessarily what you perceive as a Caucasian. Uh, I say that because she's actually not black as in people think african-american or somebody joked that she was american african which they said sounds kind of scary 
you know, it might be interesting this time for that to happen. And it might be uh, maybe it's on the right track next time. Let's get there to be an independent party that wins for president. You know, I mean, I think as people broaden their thoughts of who can be president, you know, I, I mean, we had Obama and, uh, you know, there have been some women that have for our ran years ago as the vice president. And then you had the woman from Alaska as vice president as a candidate. And now if you'd have a president and you had Mrs. Clinton running, Hillary running, you know, I think that broadens people's perspective on who could be president. And it might also broaden them to think about independence more. I mean, it sounds Sounds odd, but I think when they stop not thinking it has to be a white male, I think it might broaden their whole mind to what the possibilities are, other than just the political parties. But it might make them think a little bit more out of the box. I don't know what your thought is on that, but I think it might help them with that. Well, I certainly support the idea of merit being really the only criterion for selecting a president or selecting a person for any position. So whether that person is male or female or whatever their ethnic background is or other aspects of their lives, whether they're straight or gay, I'm completely indifferent to those attributes. I look at the policies that that person is in favor of. I look at that person's record if he or she or it has a prior record of policy achievements or serving in a particular office. And I look at whether that person is going to move the activities of that office or the country in a beneficial direction. So I definitely would not reject somebody based on any of those circumstantial attributes. And I think there can be a broadening over time of essentially who is seen as possibly qualifying for that role. I wouldn't rule out supporting an AI for president at some point in time that may actually end up being a more rational kind of leader than a human president. Mm. But I do hold that it's important to have as open a playing field as possible, where these decisions are made without undue barriers to entry. So the voters should be the ones who decide, not essentially political insiders who often make it prohibitively difficult for people to run for office. Like these ballot access requirements are extremely difficult to overcome in many states. The states that we are trying to get ballot access in Louisiana and Tennessee are the easiest throughout the country, but there are some where hundreds of thousands of petition signatures are required. And one has to do that every single election cycle. So massive amounts of money have to be spent, for example. So that's bad for anybody of any background, any set of attributes who wants to run, who is not part of that political establishment. And I think, yes, more women should try to run for president. More people of, let's say, minority backgrounds should try to run for president. But often they can't because they're not part of this political establishment. And the political establishment may have a few people in it whom it tries to promote as being candidates who are of a different mold, and maybe they are to a certain extent. But that's still not the kind of, let's say, equal opportunity playing field that we would want to have within the political system. So I think to get more inclusion, you need to have a system where ballot access is a lot easier. Access to debates, access to media is a lot easier. The media doesn't have this inclination to keep out any challengers to the political establishment. And you need a situation where you have 
rank preference voting, where you have maybe even proportional representation as exists in some parliamentary democracies so that people don't feel like they need to vote for the choice that is most likely to win or most likely to defeat the choice that they would hate the most. Oh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I commend you on the fact that you look at the issues and stuff. And I don't want to be the devil's advocate here, but I think a lot of people are swayed by whether they like a person or not. And uh, it's more about how they feel about a person than always the issues. And and I think people have a habit of doing that. And uh, I think that's some of that, I think, is the reason Hillary, one of the reasons also Hillary didn't win originally, too. There's a lot of people that don't like the way she comes across. And it really doesn't have anything to do with how she would have been as a president. It had to do with more how she made people feel. And uh, it's a pity people do that, but they do do that. And uh, they do that in a lot of things. And, uh, I, you know, I do music. I know you do some music. And I said that to my son one time. A lot of times I, I have found in a lot of things, it's more whether people like you than really what the issues are. And uh, I hate to say it in politics. It should be probably more the issues and how you're willing to do it. But sometimes it comes down to how people feel about somebody. And uh, I don't know how we can get past that in elections, but it, I don't think it's always good for us. You know, just going by, you know, the fact that you like a person. But then again, you know, I'm not sure. Sometimes I'm not sure how to go about things. But I think as, as long as things keep changing and progressing, I, I think it's good. I think it's good that all the extra parties are out there. And that they're working like the Transhumanist Party getting out there. And you've gotten the Transhumanist Party's gotten some press. There was that woman that was kind of negatively talking in her videos about the Transhumanist Party and about Tom Ross. But in all reality, like I say, there's no bad press. The fact that they're mentioning to it hopefully got people to go out and look and really see what Tom was talking about, really what the issues were. I think that's good. But I know I won't keep you too much longer. I think right now we're at a point I'm very interested in seeing how it's going to go with Harris's choice of the vice president and how that might also uh, energize the Democrats and also maybe destable Trump some more, too. But that'll be hopefully hopefully we'll find that out soon. And that's interesting. And uh, maybe we have to have one more talk before the election about how we think things are going to go. So, but I like your idea, Pete, and he just did great this week, like I said, with his speaking on Fox, and then he was on with John Stewart, and John Stewart, you know, mentioned about him doing great with that, and Pete had kind of laughed about it. He, he didn't expect to become, uh, you know, the spokesperson for the party against the Fox News, you know, the, like their special representative just to be against the, the Fox News, but he did a great job, and I think he probably would be a, a great choice like you said, and uh, I think that's a good point. But thank you again. Anything you'd want to say, uh, any points you think we haven't covered yet that you'd want to get out there before we end this one? Well, as always, I would encourage people to check out the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Go to transhumanist-party.org for the latest updates on the Ross Tweed campaign. And also, please check out the debate performance that Tom Ross and Daniel Tweed engaged in. So the Free and Equal Elections Foundation held a debate in Las Vegas on July 12th. And on July 14th, we held a stream where our candidates were asked the same questions as the three candidates on that stage, the Libertarian, Green, and Constitution Party candidates. And they were quite eloquent in their responses and in making their case to the American electorate. So please check that out. And also, again, go to tomross.com slash 2024.html. Get involved with the campaign as a volunteer. And if you live in Tennessee or Louisiana, please consider becoming an elector. That would help us greatly. Finally, 
check out the virtual enlightenment salons on my YouTube channel, which is G Stolyarov the second. So the first letter of my first name, my last name followed by the second every Sunday at 4 PM Eastern time, 1 PM Pacific time. We have in-depth conversations on politics, philosophy, culture, science, technology with some of the leading thinkers in transhumanism or who are transhumanism adjacent. So please check out those conversations as well. Well, thank you. And like you always say, I will put links down below for people to go to. And thank you again. And like I said, I think we might have to do this one more time before the election. I'm feeling better about the elections than I was a couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, all I want to say is, you know, I'm, I'm in my 60s and I kind of feel bad for a Sleepy Joe, but he kind of was getting to be Sleepy Joe. And I like him and I've seen him talk and, and I noticed an interesting thing. It's the last thing I'll say. I know I'll get on my tangent. So, but when I saw him speak during the daytime, he seemed to be vibrant and really be able to put out a good speech. But when you saw him talk at nighttime, he seemed very drained. And I think that's some of the issue too. Plus, I also say, I think, and I saw it when Trump was getting him perturbed, I think his frustration also, instead of driving him to speak better, I think it kind of off-centered him. So, but like I said, getting older myself, I feel for him, and I have issues with things I can't remember, or, or na I'm horrible with names. I've always been horrible with names, and I've only gotten worse. So, I mean, I feel bad about some of that stuff for him, and the fact that but then again, the transhumanists, the whole idea is to try and keep us healthy and better and not only long lives, but quality of lives. So, you know, that's things that uh, as a transhumanist, we're hoping to help prevent and work towards betterment itself. So that was just my last little thing there. Sorry about that. But thank you again for being with us. And we'll put some more things below then. And, and thank you again. Thank you, John. And live long and prosper. Yes, live long and prosper.